If you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be covering probably the most uh, difficult verses of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Um, there are a lot of theological uh, uh, opinions on this that are out there, on what Jesus meant when he, when he spoke what he spoke. I'm going to cover uh, this in a way in which I'm going to try to cover the things that, that they all agree on and that I agree on, mainly two things. And, um, um, and really, I do think that the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, this is sort of the core of it. And so we're going to look at a lot of Scripture really fast. I hope I don't talk too fast. It'll be on the screen, but also uh, this is video. So this week, if you miss some, you can uh, pull it off there or you can text me and I'll shoot you all the text I use. So let's get started. Matthew 5, 17 through 20. And Jesus says this, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the, the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, I've labored over this. I ask you to bless it. I ask your Holy Spirit to take it from my mouth to their hearts, that we all might grow, that we all might have greater understanding of, of what Jesus is saying there and, and why it is important that uh, we not only know this, but that we walk in its truth in a way to glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I'm basically gonna look at this in three ways. First, Christ and his relationship to the law the Christian and his relationship with the laws of God, and third, uh, the, the Christian's need for God's righteousness for salvation. So Christ and his relationship with the law of God, the Christian and his relationship with the law of God, and the Christian's need for God's righteousness for salvation. So let's start with Christ and his relationship with the law of God. Look at what he says in Matthew 5, 17. He says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Now, this is an interesting declaration by Christ concerning his relationship with the law of God. Why did he make this statement? Well, let me give you some context of, of, of the Jewish culture uh, of that day. When the Jews, uh, they basically had four concepts. Now, this is, this is background stuff, and most of you are going to roll your eyes, and I don't care, but it really is important to understanding what Jesus is saying here. It, they had four concepts that they dealt with when they contemplated the law of God. If they just heard the law of God, immediately in Jewish culture, they would have thought of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20. We, most of us know about the Ten Commandments. It, it, we might not be able to say them off the top of our head, but we know what the, you know, the Ten Commandments. The second thing was the Pentateuch, which was the five books written by Moses uh, at, at the beginning of the, of the Bible. They would have thought of that. They would have thought of really the entire Jewish scriptures. Any time in the New Testament, I, I want to be careful here, when you see Jesus or the apostles talking about scriptures, uh, remember that, that the New Testament had not been written uh, <laughs> while they were alive, right? And so when they're referring to scriptures up until towards the end, they were talking about the Old Testament. That was their Bible, right? That was their Bible. But here's the fourth one. And this is the one that got all of them bogged down and what Jesus is trying to clear up. And that is the rabbinical scribal traditions. Now, what were those? We talked about them a little bit. This was the thousands of detailed and external requirements that the Pharisees had obscured, that, that had added to the commands of God, telling people they had to obey them to be right with God. The problem is God never ordered that from them. But because they were the Pharisees and they were looked at as religious leaders through the generations, people just began to 
believe it. Like, okay, these are spiritual men. They're telling us this is what we've got to do. The problem was it wasn't of God. And not only was it not of God, but it was obscuring the commands of God in their life. So because of that, a Jew trying to love God, live for God in that day and time tended to, to be constantly in a spiritual stress because the Pharisees were making people believe that you had to not only keep the laws of God, but all the requirements were adding to the laws of God as if God didn't know how to complete his laws. And so the people trying to love God well were following these rabbin rabbinical teachings. And you say, well, okay, you know, that's big deal. Oh, let's move on. It's still going on in the church today. We are adding things to the Word of God that God hasn't added. You want me to give you some examples? When you come to church, you got to be in a suit and a dress, preferably one or the other. Well, we're supposed to give our best, aren't we? Yeah, the best is your heart. Amen. Right? <laughs> Uh, uh, you got to do this. Uh, uh, you can't go here. You can't do that. And, and what we're doing is we're adding things to scriptures. And now for generations, that stuff has been perpetuated in the church. And I hear people quoting that stuff more than the word of God. And they don't even know what they're doing wrong because they've been hearing it for generations. Got to have church twice on Sunday. Show me. Do you know how that started in the Western world? Back in the days of horse and buggies, they would travel to the church. It took a long time. They would come to church. They would eat their lunch on the grounds. And then they said, well, since we're here, let's do another one. There's nothing wrong with two. You want to have five? That's okay. Don't make it law. We are to meet. You understand what I'm saying? So we have passed on, got to have pews, stained glass windows, got to have a steeple, got to have, no, 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 you don't have to have any of that. Well, I came out of the Baptist movement. We said, if you want to be a Baptist person, you got to get redunked. We don't care if you were biblically dunked as a Methodist. If you're going to be a part of the Baptist church, you, we got to dunk you again. Show me. We're doing it today, folks. That's why when I hear that cocky mamie stuff, I always say this, Lee, show me. Where are you getting that from? Now, listen. Listen, I don't know the Bible from cover to cover. Can you handle that? Paul said he looked through a glass dimly, so you better be able to handle that. So I'll take my brother Lee. Lee, if you've studied Exodus 29 for the last 10 years, you're probably going to break it down better than me. You understand what I'm saying? We, none of us have arrived, but listen to me, friends. When you try to be a witness for Jesus Christ, you try to speak for God, you better make sure that what you're saying aligns with God's Word. And don't put on people's shoulders the garbage that weighs them down. That's what this rabbinical traditions were doing. Man, they had put such a 800-pound gorilla on the people of God. <laughs> that's why Matthew 11, 28 through 30, that's why Jesus gives this invitation. And I'm going to read a whole bunch of scripture to you here in a minute. And I, I, I just, Lord, please give them ears to hear. Uh, when Jesus gives this, uh, uh, this invitation, come, come. <laughs> uh, you you want to be a follower of Christ? It starts with coming. It starts with coming to Jesus Christ, not coming to AFM, not being a church member. It, <laughs> come, come where? To me. <laughs> Christianity is a call to come to Jesus Christ. 
We've made it about denominations. We've made it about church buildings and all that kind of... No, Christianity is coming to Jesus Christ. Come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden. I just told you what made them weary and heavy laden. That the Pharisees and scribes had heaped thousands of, of external requirements that they might be right with God. And Jesus knew it. He knew it before he came to this earth because he's God. And he, this is such a powerful invitation he's giving us. Mary, he wants you to come to him. He, now, great that you come to AFM because hope, hopefully you come to AFM. And in doing so, you, you come to Jesus. You, you come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. And what does Jesus promise those that will come to him? He says, I will give you rest. Rest from what? From our jobs? No. The rest he's talking about is a spiritual rest. Rest. In other words, that you aren't going to try to work your way to heaven by keeping a bunch of traditions that, you, that God never required. And by the way, you can't keep the law perfectly. And the more you try, uh, you, you will never do it. And, and the law was given. That might shut us all up in sin. So that would take us in our desperation to the cross. Do you get that? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse 29, take my yoke upon... Now, I've said this a zillion times to you. So you come to Jesus for, for salvation. You come to Jesus so you can get out of the hamster wheel of trying to make yourself right with God on your own efforts. And you come to Jesus, and when you come to Jesus, the first thing he wants you to do is yoke yourself to him. Not just for salvation, but because you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. He wants to teach you through the Holy Spirit how to follow him. Do you get that? If you're not doing that, you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I love you. I don't want you to get mad and leave. I want you to get mad enough to check it out and change. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And I am gentle and humble in heart. The Pharisees weren't gentle and they weren't humble in heart. And you will, his promise to us, if we'll come to him and take his joke and learn from him, Jesus says, listen, I promise you, you will find rest for your souls. And verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Coming to Christ is admitting that you are what the Bible says you are and all of us are. Uh, sinners in need of a savior and coming to Jesus is just the surrender of your life Sally it's falling into the arms of the savior at the cross and saying I can't do it I've blown it with you God but I believe you've sent your son Jesus and I've heard his call to come to him and at the foot of the cross, I'm coming to Jesus and I'm gonna yoke myself to the Lord Jesus Christ so that I can learn how to love him and follow him to bring glory to him and live my life for his glory and not my own. So Jesus, when he started his earthly ministry, he was rocking the boat with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Hujajis and the, how about these? Because the people had become confused about what they should follow and what they shouldn't. And I think there's a lot of that in the church today. That's why when we pray, we do things like that. I love you. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. It's like, like I'm not real sure who I'm supposed to pray to, but I'm going to throw them all in there just in case. We're not so far removed from some silliness ourselves. And it is important that we change. So Jesus starts his earthly ministry. And you'll see, I'll just give you two examples real quick. Look at uh, Mark 2, 23 through 28. Just an example of how Jesus was rocking these Pharisees' world. Because remember, they've thrown all these hundreds and thousands of requirements. And here, here let's check this out. 
And Jesus comes and he just blows them all up. Now, to the crowd, though, it was like a heavyweight fight between Jesus and the Pharisees. Who do we listen to? Well, I don't know. He's raising the dead. What do you, what do you got? And the Bible reads in Mark 2, verse 23, he says, and it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Now, if you know about the Jewish Sabbath, they weren't to do anything but worship and rest on the Sabbath. And, and, and the reason why God did that is in the Old Testament, when the entire nation of Israel would shut down for that day and just worship, man, it made their pagan neighbors say, huh? Because they shut down. Okay, let's see what the heart of the principle of the Sabbath is. And it happened that he, Christ, was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. Now, if you know what the Pharisees taught as the Sabbath rules, that would be sin. You're not to work. That's what they told people. Notice what the Pharisees said. Verse 24, the Pharisees were saying to him, look... Why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? The Pharisees perverted the laws of God and added amendments and requirements that weren't there. Here's what Jesus said to them in verse 25. And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest, and he also gave it to those who were with him. You can imagine the Pharisees they're going, oh, King David? Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for men and not man for the Sabbath. The Pharisees wanted the external attaboy following. And Jesus said, you don't even understand the Sabbath. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And you know that blew their mind. And then we read in Mark 3, 1 through 5. We just keep the narrative going. He entered into a synagogue. And a man was there whose hand was withered. And they were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Look at what they're doing with God's law. <laughs> you know, if they really cared about Jesus and thought he was going to mess up, shouldn't they have pulled him aside and talked to him? No, no. Okay, watch, fellas. Watch. We know he's been doing this stuff. It's the Sabbath. Watch. And he said to them, know this, Christ knows your heart. And he knows what you think before you do. And he said to them, have you never read what David, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Mark 5, excuse me, uh, 3, verse 1 through 5. And they were watching to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. He said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. <laughs> they had confused themselves. <laughs> How do we answer this? About the, the ox in the ditch and you, you, you get your ox out. Here's a man with a withered hand. Jesus might heal. I don't, man, we're sort of trapped. And after looking around at them with anger, after looking around at them with anger, you see, the Bible doesn't say not to be angry. It says, to, not to be angry and to sin, right? There is righteous anger that Jesus had, that the Father has, and the Holy Spirit has, and that we should have, amen, against sin and against those roadblocks that people put in the way of people coming to Christ, right? They're, you know, like that's why drug, uh, drug addicts trying to come to Jesus, about 80% of churches would ship them down the road. You're not our type. You're not who we're wanting to draw in, and he said to them, is it lawful to do good or do to harm on the Sabbath to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. And after looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, grieved 
At the heart of it, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him so that how they might destroy him. They were not dumb. He was absolutely bringing to a shattering halt their rabbinical traditions that they were teaching as if it was law. So here you had it. You had the people watching Jesus do these things, and they were in awe of his power, but confused because of the rabbinical traditions that had so infiltrated their understanding of God's law. And, and, and these Pharisees were trying to accuse Jesus of breaking the law. And Jesus knew it. And if he breaks the law, he can't be our Savior. That's why that's significant. Amen? Amen. If he at any point in his earthly journey had broke one of God's laws, he would never have been able to be the unblemished male lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus says, as we start this, he says this. Remember, he's teaching his disciples, right? He's teaching his disciples, but the crowd is there as well. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. That word fulfill is to fill up, to draw out, complete. John MacArthur says about Christ's declaration, Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament by being its fulfillment. He did not simply teach it fully and exemplify it fully. He was it fully. He did not come simply to teach righteousness and to model righteousness. He came as divine righteousness. What he said and what he did reflected who he was, and the same would go for the Pharisees. The great German theologian Bonhoeffer said this, he has in fact nothing to add to the commandments of God except this, he keeps them. To which another guy said his purpose was not to change the law, still less to annul it, but to reveal the full depth of meaning that it was intended to hold. So then he fulfills it by declaration and demonstration, the radical demands of the righteousness of God found in the law. Jesus says... In verse 18, uh, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Until all is accomplished. What did Jesus mean that he didn't come to abolish but to fulfill? Well, if you read Matthew's letter from the beginning, you would see that Matthew is laying out a case for Jesus fulfilling all the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. And I want to read to you a few things that, and so now when we get to chapter five, it's, this isn't isolated when he says, I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. Let's just quickly read some verses out of Matthew uh, in the verse four chapters about Jesus fulfilling. Let's go. Let's start with um, Matthew one and verse... uh, 22 and 23. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, right? Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God's with us. Now back up to verse 22. Okay, now all this took place to fulfill, to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, okay? Let's go on to Matthew 2, verses 4 through 6. By the way, that was a quotation from Isaiah 7, 14. Matthew 2, 4 through 6, we read this. Gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Verse 5, they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. Verse 6, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judea, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. That's a quotation from Micah 5.2. Let's go to Matthew 2.15, and we read this. He remained there until the death of Herod, Egypt. This was to fulfill, this was to fulfill, this was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. That is from Hosea. Uh, 11, 1. Matthew 2, 17, we read the following. And then what he had, had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. What was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. That's out of Jeremiah 31, 15. Matthew 3, 3. 
says this, for this is the one referred uh, to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And that's a, a quotation out of Isaiah 43 concerning John the Baptist. Matthew 4, 12 through 16, we're moving right up to chapter 5. Matthew 4, uh, and starting verse 12, now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he would, withdrew into Galilee. And verse 13, it says, and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulon and Naphtali. Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, right? This was to fulfill what was spoken through the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. I can't. Yeah. By the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of Gentiles, verse 16, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death upon them a light dawned. That is out of Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. So when Jesus says he didn't come to abolish the law but to fulfill, he was the fulfillment of all the Old Testament. We know this if you look at Luke chapter 24 and verses 25 through 27 on the road to Emmaus when he, when he uh, joins uh, two people walking and he inquires what's going on. Here's what he says to them. Uh, Luke 24, 25 through 27. Then he opened their mind. Oh, excuse me. No, no. 20, 25 through 27. Sorry, Dan, if I didn't have it. We're going to go here next. But 20, same chapter, verses 25 through 27. I would just read it, but I know some of you don't have Bibles so, uh, here today, so I want you to see it on the screen. Chapter 24, verses 25 through 27. This is when he uh, has joined uh, those walking on the road to Emmaus. Do you got it, Dan? Luke 24, 25 through 27. If not, I'll just read it. It's significant to Jesus being the fulfillment. Oh, he got it. Okay. And he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart. These were the two walking on the road to Emmaus. And he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Verse 27. Then beginning with Moses, the first five books, and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now he meets with the disciples in Luke 24, later, after his resurrection, verse 44. Stay with me. Don't get all glassy-eyed. Luke 24, 24. The ones you had in 44. Okay. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. That all things which are written about me, where? Where were these things written? In the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must, he basically Jesus saying the Old Testament. All the things that I spoke to you out of scriptures, right, uh, uh, must be fulfilled. Verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. What scriptures? The Old Testament scriptures. That's all they had at the time was the Old Testament. That's why people say, why should I read the Old Testament? The Old Testament is very important so that you get a balanced view of who God is and what his plan is. In verse 46, and he said to them, thus it was written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. Verse 47 and that, he, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. 48, you are witnesses of these things. 49, of his death, resurrection. For, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, the Holy Spirit, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And so what we see when Jesus said, I did not come to abolish it, I came to fulfill it. He was the fulfillment of the law. Jesus is not a side character in the narrative of God and man. He is the center between God and man. 
And he knew that the Pharisees had so messed up the minds and hearts of their fellow Jews that they were trying to accuse him of being a lawbreaker. And Jesus is defending himself saying, I am not a lawbreaker. And we're going to find out later in this uh, fifth chapter of Matthew that he's going to give uh, six corrective illustrations concerning how the Pharisees perverted these six subjects in a way in which they could live them on the outside but not act like they were guilty on the inside. We're going to learn about murder. Did you know you can be a murderer without murdering anyone? You can't. Did you know you can commit adultery without ever committing adultery? You can. Christianity is the only, I hate the word, religion in which God rescues man. Every other religion is about God making his way, excuse me, mankind making his way back to whatever God they're trying to make their way to. Because man, at the center of man is, is I. The center of sin is I. And it's, we make even our, our religion about us rather than about God. And Christianity is the only one that makes it about God. So we're going to see Jesus say that, that his followers should not annul the law. So we're going to move from Jesus in the law to, to his disciples in the law. And it's really important that we understand as we make this transition that there, uh, one, as I read about one pastor theologian saying, that the righteousness of Jesus is primarily talking about here in this text, the first three verses, is about the righteousness followers of Jesus are to live out. Active righteousness. Not positional righteousness that we get in the crowd. Now, verse 20 is in reference to the positional imputed righteousness we receive of Christ. But when we get to what Jesus is about to say to the disciples, we need to understand that. And it's important that we understand that. Remember, the Sermon on the Mount is not about how man can get to God. It's about those who are already in relationship with Jesus, how to live their lives for his glory. Guys, it matters how we live our lives. The only way the world will know you're his is by the way you live and the way you talk. I love in Acts when it says about Peter and John, it was obvious they had been with Jesus. You know, when they had stood before him after they healed him, it was cool, like it was obvious. It was obvious to them that they'd been with Jesus. Sally, is it obvious to others that you've been with Jesus? I want it to be obvious about me that I've been with Jesus. How about you? You want it to be obvious that, hey, man, this is the dude. Now, we didn't walk with Jesus, but we walked following Jesus. He doesn't live on the outside now. He lives, the Spirit of God lives on the inside of us, giving us the power to do it. So let's look at the Christian and his relationship to the Word of God. Notice verse 19. Jesus says, he moves from himself to now to his followers. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now listen, he didn't say you wouldn't be in the kingdom if you broke a commandment if by your actions you taught someone else to break a commandment. He said you'd be the least in the kingdom. You want to be great in the eyes of the Lord in his kingdom? Be obedient to his commands. Jesus said in John 14, 15, the acid test for whether you love Jesus is not what you say with your lips. It's what you do with your life. The Pharisees would have swore to you they were the best followers of God in Israel. We're going to find out they weren't. Jesus said this in John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, if I asked every one of you today, do you love Jesus? There are no one of you that, well, maybe a teenager might, but most of us would say, yeah, I love Jesus. Well, are you keeping his commands? Well, well, I mean, I'm saved by grace. I, 
I don't. We so cheap in grace when we live with that kind of mentality. Amen. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Obedience to Jesus was proof that you were his. We're going to find that out in this sermon later on. Remember what he says about the two houses, right? The wise man, what, practices, obeys his teachings, and his house is built on a rock. The foolish man is the one who hears those same teachings, ignores them, and he builds his house on sand, and his house is going to crash. And if not in this life, it's going to crash on judgment day, and it will crash, and it will be an eternal crash. I don't know how we've gotten in this mindset that we can love Jesus and not obey Jesus. Now, I'm not talking perfection. Nobody who's ever lived, no matter how great a saint they are, were perfect because if they were, they wouldn't have needed a Savior. Amen. But we should be pro progressing every day of our Christian life to be more and more like Jesus through following his commands. And that is the reason the Holy Spirit is in your heart so that you have a resident God in your life teaching you how to walk with the Son of God. But if you never open the Bible, you can't be obedient. And I'm telling you in the church, and I love you so much, there are so many, probably here, that never touched the Bible all week long, and they would fight you to say they love Jesus. I don't know how you obey what you never read. What would you think of a job that hired you, told you none of your responsibilities, and then jumped on you when you failed? You would say, what? I didn't know. I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Why didn't you tell me? You know what we're not going to be able to say on Judgment Day? That. Because you do know. And today you're going to walk out of here wise or foolish. And every week you come and hear the Word of God preach, wise or foolish. And it doesn't matter whether I'm preaching, Lee's preaching, Ray's preaching, Andy, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's the Word of God. What are you doing with the commands of the Word of God? Jesus said the level of your love for Him is in direct relationship to the obedience of your life to Him. It's not you saying it. Wives, how long would you put up with men who swore they loved you and never came home and cheated on you? But they came home and said, baby, I love you. Don't worry. You got my heart. It's a country and western song. Why would we think the Lord Jesus Christ who left glory, laid aside his glory, came to this earth, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life for the sole purpose of glorifying God and being the sacrifice that you and I need so that we could be back in relationship with the Father, that he was willing to let God pour his wrath out through the beatings and the spittings and all of that and hung on a cross. And, and now we, we look at him, and I, I, that's why that, that powerful question Jesus asked in Luke 6, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Jesus saying that is foolishness. That very title tells you to submit to me. And that's why in Romans 10, 9, look at this. But you won't hear this say, I'm sorry, Dan. I don't know how hard it is for you to pull this up. Romans 10, 9. 10, 9. Yeah, those are like, we're, we're going to get those verses, but 10, 9, okay. That, here, here's, here's what Paul says, Romans 10. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Does it say Savior to you, Pat, there? It doesn't say confess him as Savior. But most of us are, are trying to work a deal with God that we want Jesus to be our Savior, Sally, not our Lord, because if we call him our Lord, guess what? We got to yoke up. We got to yoke up. We got to submit. We got to surrender. If he's just our savior, that just means he's rescued us. If you hear nothing else I say, you hear this. Jesus rescues you as, as your savior when you submit to him as Lord. 
He is our Lord and Savior, but it's when we, we surrender, not just with our lips, but with our life, and we say, Lord, that's why he says in Luke 6, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the, the very concept of Lord means I'm in charge. If you confess with your mouth Jesus, Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is it, Romans 10, 10. Just these two verses, listen. With our mouth, excuse me, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, that's that imputed positional righteousness we get at the cross. And with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. That's why when I lead someone to Christ, I find somebody he can talk to, right? If, you, if I led you to Christ and I could get you in front of someone, what did I do? Hey, hey, tell them, tell them. Why? She said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. If you deny me, he's got no secret service Christians. We're not, we're not ashamed of our Savior who bled and died for us. Because he did, we no longer live for ourselves, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, but we live for the one who died for us. We give him our life because he gave us his. But we're not doing that. Come on, come on, be real. You know who's in charge of your life. Most of you, come on, can we love, can we be real? Here's what we say. We say things like this when we know we're going against something the Word of God teaches. I don't think that's, I don't think it's that big a deal. Really. Moses committed one sin, Lee, and it kept him out of the promised land. How many? One. And God said, because you've done, disobeyed me, you're not going. Now, I'm not preaching to work salvation here. Don't get me wrong. But we do, need to, we do need to stop acting like God doesn't care how we live our lives simply because we say Jesus is Lord. In fact, it's because we say that that our lives should display the change. Are you hearing me? I'm not mad at you. Do I sound mad? I'm not mad. No, I'm really not, Jim. You know, my family sometimes. <laughs> and when I talk to them, <laughs> wow, oh man, dial it back. Cut the caffeine in half. <sighs> Let me tell you something, man. I've given my life to this, <sighs> to him. And I love you enough to tell you maybe what you don't want to hear in your flesh. Amen. But I love you. And you are going to die one day and you are going to stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And you know what you're not going to say to him? Well, uh, 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 uh. I'm sorry. I, I didn't know that, that part of following you was to obey you and love what you love and hate what you hate. I sort of loved what you hated. Now, now that I'm here, I sort of realized I loved what you hated and I didn't really love what you loved because it required me to not make me the center of my world. Jesus says about the Christian and his commands, what's he say? Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Listen, friend, the level of your reward is, is directly linked to the level of your obedience. And on that day, that reward's eternal, by the way. This stuff here that we're chasing after, Moths and, and we're going to find that out in, in this sermon. Moths and rust corrupt. And, but yet we're chasing that. Pat, we are chasing that with all we got. And the reason we're doing it, if we're doing it, is because the word of God is not a constant in our lives. Hey, men, are you missing the men's Bible study? I am. Gathering together at Open God's Word. Lee, you missing it? Putting you on the spot right there, Lee. Lee's not real emotional, but Lee, you missing it? <laughs> I miss gathering, I do. 
I miss seeing guys just dig into God's word, man, and see what it's doing to them and the changes that they're telling me that God is making in their life, man, that the word of God is becoming alive to them. And, and Mary, I, I remember when we first started saying something. Now, I, forgive me later if you want to kick me in the shins on the way out. When we first started AFM, let me tell you a little story about yourself. You probably don't know, man, you didn't like our music. You thought it was too loud. You remember all the, <laughs> Mary come in every, <laughs> Am I lying, Mary? Then we started a women's Bible study. And it changed her life. Because she was discovering the real Jesus and what he wants. And I haven't heard you say nothing about nothing for years. That's how it happens. When you finally say, Jesus, I'm going to be a Mary, not a Martha. I'm going to sit at your feet. Remember, Martha, rattling pans. I, I'm serving, but I don't like it very much. And I, I, man, my sister's ticking me off, man. I'm in here trying to make a meal for Jesus. I mean, surely sit, doing this for him, Sally, outweighs. Look at her sitting in this. Look at that. I've had it. She comes out of that kitchen, Jesus. Tell my sister to get up, quit being a deadbeat. I'm paraphrasing, <laughs> loosely paraphrasing. And, and Jesus says to Martha, 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 you're troubled about a lot of things. <laughs> That's a lot of people in church, by the way. I do, I do, I'm just I'm doing this and I'm doing that, but they're not doing this. And maybe, beep, 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 beep. Mary has chosen the better thing. Well, what did Mary choose? To sit at his feet. If Jesus had looked at Mary and said, get up and go in the kitchen, guess what Mary would have done? She would have got up and gone into the kitchen. Listen to me. Until you engage in genuine spirit-filled worship, you will not hear the voice of the Lord about what he wants you to do. You might do, but you'll be bitter like Martha. Martha. By the way, I'm not trying to give Martha a bum rap. She loved the Lord. She just got some things inverted. Have you ever swept the church building and been mad because you saw people walking out the door after lunch? You know, able-bodied people. Not cripples like me, able-bodied people. And you just watch them walk out the door. You know, you're folding tables and trying to move chairs and sweeping floors. The ladies are back there doing that thankless task of washing all the dishes. And ladies, you don't get near the credit you deserve. I'm so happy for the kitchen crew. They just work back there. They don't ask for nothing. They serve us so well. And, and then able-bodied people just walk out like, yeah, if I ate, I'm good. And then the ones that stay behind, I've heard, hey, man, what's up? What's up? Why would he eat? Listen, if you've worshiped well, you'll be singing when you sweep this floor. But if your worship is dried up, your service will become bitter. I don't do what I do for people. I do what I do for Jesus. It took me a long time to figure that out. So... Jesus knew what he's up against with the Pharisees, much like Paul had to deal with the Judaizers later in his ministry days. Jesus, in his last sermon, if you will, found in Matthew 23, 24, 25. Let me just read to you what Jesus is saying about the, the, the Pharisees. And by the way, verse 23 and verse 1, if you got it, Dan. Hey, listen, some of these verses that I didn't give Dan, they just come off. So, Dan, you're doing great. Chapter 23 and verse 1, then Jesus spoke to the crowds. That verse chapter 23, verse 1, if you can get to it, Dan, that's fine. Matthew 23, verse 1, then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, verse 2, saying, the scribes and Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. You know what that means? You know, Moses wrote the, the first five books of it. They thought they had replaced Moses. And so they felt justified giving all these add-ons. 
Look at what Jesus accuses them of in Matthew 23 and verse 2. The scribes and Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. The law, Moses was the lawgiver. That's why they felt justified pat, adding on whatever they wanted. They felt like they were entitled. Notice what he says in verse 3. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe. <laughs> but do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. In other words, the Pharisees knew the word of God. So he said, when they teach the word, do the word, even if it's coming out of their mouth. Just don't practice your following like they do because they don't follow. The big H word, hypocrites. Look at what they do, verse 4. Remember what we just read, Matthew 11. I, I, I'm hurrying, guys, I'm hurrying. Listen to me. God gave this to me late. <sighs> they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders. What did we read in Matthew 11? Come to me, and what will Jesus give people? Rest. Why do they need rest? Verse 4, Matthew 23, 4. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher. You are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not, call, do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Ex exalted. This is what Jesus said of these guys, man. They were, they, were, they were a massive roadblock to people coming to Christ because of all their do's and don'ts. And I'm sick of organized religion doing that. I'm sick of it. And I don't want AFM to ever be guilty of that. You think they can wear that? Think they can sit there? You think they can do this? You're having instruments up on stage? Shut up. Just shut up. You are embarrassing yourself to those who know the Word of God. And you are becoming a stumbling block to people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. If you leave here and badmouth AFM and your preacher, and then a friend of yours gets in crisis, hey, come to AFM. Why would I go there? You badmouth them every week. Why would I listen to your pastor? You badmouth him every week. You don't do that, though. I'm just joking. <laughs> Later in this chapter, in the eight woes that Jesus pronounces, in verse 25, this describes the Pharisees. Now, not, not all, there were some Pharisees who might have been followers, but the ones who weren't, listen to what he says in verse 25, Matthew 23, 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Now, he's saying this to them. They're there. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. See, they got it wrong. They spent their whole lives worried about their exterior. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Doesn't start with your exterior. It starts here. In your heart Amen. when you're regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God because if this gets right this will get right Nah, they were just taking care of the outside you know I I, 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 I don't know if this is a good analogy or not I dated a girl once way before you baby she was pretty miss I can't I, I go to her house and we sit down and she's hey you want to look at some albums you know pictures sure so, stack big ones. She opens one, and on the first two pages, they're all pictures of her. Okay. All pictures of her. Every picture was of her. Hey, I got an idea. You want to look at me? Won't that be fun? I said, are the next two albums like this? Yeah, I'm good. Like, I'm, I'm good. 
I've got the picture. Her parents worshipped her. I mean, they worshipped her. She was the pinnacle of their life, this, this girl. I won't say her name because I don't have a clue who listens to these, but you know who you are. And... Uh, <laughs> If I get an email, I'll let you know. So, and I hadn't thought of this person in, you know, 40 years. It, but when Jesus says this about the Pharisees, how they made the outside clean, but the inside was rotten. Now, I, don't, I don't know her inside, if it was rotten, but I do know that her whole life was about her outside. Ladies, you run the danger of that. You get your worth about how people see your outside. We men, to some degree, but look at us. <laughs> I mean, sorry, men. Walk around with a chipped tooth, look like a goober. Can't get to it to July 5th. Ah, whatever. I just won't smile. But really for all of us, we'll come in our dresses at Easter and suits and nice clothes and we'll go through the perfunctory motions of worship. You know that, right? Some of us have never really worshiped a day in our life. And I'm talking about the people that show up to church. I ain't talking about the ones that don't. That's a whole nother deal for a whole nother day. But we're here, and all we can think about is, man, I hope Jim is short today. Verse 28, so you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. He tells them that they're whitewashed sepulchers, but they're full of dead man bones. He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Verse 27, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they're full of dead man's bones and all uncleanliness. And here's the thing, guys. You know who we never fool? We never fool Jesus. Like right now, he knows your thoughts right now. We never fool him. He knows our, the Word of God says God knows our thoughts before we know them. So whatever thought you just now had about what I just said, He knew and He knows. I don't want any of us to be like the Pharisees. Walking around externally, acting like we're all right on the inside. We're just a messed up human being, man. We're going to find in these six corrective illustrations, like I said about murder. Like, you know, the Pharisees, I'm not a murderer. Jesus said, if you hate, you are. You adulterer, Pharisees, I'm not an adulterer. If you've lusted after a woman, you are. I mean, Jesus just knocks out all the crutches in the sermon. I told you, before it's done, all of us are going to get hit. I don't think any one of us will leave here unscathed. We're going to be scathed, if that's the word. We are. You know why? Because mankind's never changed. We're rotten to the core. And if we wake up on any given day and don't crucify that flesh, we will stink like we've always stunk before we knew Jesus. So Jesus wraps this up. Chapter 5 and verse 20. Matthew 5 verse 20. And now he's going to really rock everyone's world on that hillside. Here's what he says. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Scribes and Pharisees, they're our religious leaders. It was Nicodemus. Jesus said, how can you be a leader, a spiritual leader of Israel and, 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 and not know about being born again? It's all through the scriptures, Old Testament, that God's going to give us new hearts. Amen? Not, not resurrect the old one. He's going to give us new ones. It's there, Nicodemus. You've been studying. Oh, what's wrong with you? 
What's wrong with them is that they lived on the outside for the glory of themselves rather than for God. And now Jesus is telling his disciples and everyone on that hillside that day. Now remember, the crowds think the Pharisees, the scribes and Pharisees are it spiritually. And now they can't even live up to what the Pharisees are saying. Right? Remember what Jesus said about Matthew 23, 4, about how they put heavy burdens on people. And they're thinking, man, I can't even do... I, I, Sally, I can't live with my... my Spiritual leaders are telling me to do. And now you're saying to me, Jesus, my righteousness has to exceed theirs. What? I'm doomed. No, you're not. Because what's the answer? How can we get a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes? How do we get it? Look at 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. This is how you get a righteousness that exceeds theirs. You ready? He, God, He, God, the Father, made Him Christ the Son. God the Father made Christ the Son who knew no sin. Remember, He was perfect. He was sinless. He had lived at 33 and a half years in total perfection to the law, to God's commands. That's why he could be our sacrifice. Now notice what Jesus willingly does because we need a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes. Here's what he does. He, he, the father, made him the son who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. To be sin on our behalf. Whose behalf? Those that God calls. The elect. Those that God is saving. Okay, that's who he's become sin for on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Why did Jesus do that? Well, there are many reasons, but one of the big ones is that through his sacrifice, he allowed the father, he became the propitiation for us. He he absorbed all of the wrath that God has had since mankind was created, all of the sin, past, present, future, for those that God is saving, he has, he poured his wrath out on his son. And Jesus knew it was going to happen. Which is why he said, if this cup could pass before me, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He knew what was about to happen. Jesus hated sin. Love sinners, hated sin. We got it all twisted. We hate the sinners. <laughs> G- uh, the Bible says he didn't come to condemn the world the first time, but that the world through him might be saved. That ain't how we're operating. We're, we condemning people left and right as if we weren't them before God graciously saved us through his grace. And now we get all self-righteous on the other side, which is so, I don't even, I, I don't get it. He made him to be sin. on our behalf. Listen to me, friend. God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that if you would put your faith in his son, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, that if you're willing today to come clean before God and say, God, I am full of dead man's bones, man. I am that per-. And you might have been religious. You might be here today religious and lost. And you've been in the church your whole life. Everyone thinks you're saved. And now God is whispering in your ear, you don't have what you think you have. And, and I, I'm, I'm drawing you today to say, repent. Repent. Turn around. Quit worrying about what they're going to think about you. Because if you worry about what they think now... You're going to really be worried about what I think then. Come, Jesus says to me. Come, if you're willing to agree with God that you are a sinner that deserves his wrath and his judgment. But today, through the Holy Spirit, he has lifted the veil off your darkened heart. And for the first time in your life, you're realizing that I am the sinner that Jim and all the preachers have said I am in the Word of God. But I now see the Savior. I see Jesus. And I, and I, 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 I want to be right with Jesus. I want to love him, serve him, follow him. 
because he paid a price I could not pay. And that he alone was willing to take all of my sin and give me all of his righteousness. That's how you get a righteousness that exceeds the Pharisees and the scribes. You get the imputed righteousness that we get at the cross when we say, when we surrender to Jesus Christ. Right then at that exchange, right then, instantly, when you become born again, it's instant, you become born again. Uh, uh, um, you're regenerated by the Holy Spirit. You become that new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, Titus 3. You, you, you've been regenerated. Right, right away, bam, you're regenerated. You're at this new creation. And, and now the Spirit of God is going to live in you because he's going to uh, draw you and teach you and learn you how you are to follow the Son of God in a way that makes much of Jesus and not of yourself. But the reward in heaven is great sacrifice now for what's up ahead. If you live for the now, you'll lose the later. The righteousness needed for the kingdom of heaven, man can't do. We can't do it, never could. And God never intended us to. He gave us the law that was gonna shut us up in our sin. That's not a bad thing, the law is good. But when I look at the law and I realize I can't keep it, that's a good place to be because it's then that I'll turn to the Savior, the Lord Jesus. And I'll turn to the Savior, the Lord Jesus. I'll close with this. Brethren, Paul says in Romans 10, 1, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. That's my prayer for every one of you today. That's my prayer for every single one of you today. It's for your salvation. For I testify about them. He's talking about his fellow Jews that had chased after this, the Pharisees' way of, uh, of earning their own righteousness. He said, for I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. That's, that's the thing right there, man. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Wow. How horrible will it be to get to the end of your life having pursued God in the wrong way only to hear Jesus say on that day in Matthew 7, depart from me. I never knew you, you that practice lawlessness. What an affront to God it is for any man to think he can be good enough on his own merit to be welcomed into heaven. If that's true, then God cruelly sent his son to die. And God's not cruel. You can't earn your way there, friend. It's only through the blood of Jesus when you surrender your life to Jesus Christ at the cross to make him Lord. Because when you make him Lord, he becomes Savior. You can't have his salvation without his Lordship. He's Lord. I hope you've done that. I hope you've really knelt spiritually at the foot of the cross and confessed to God what he already knows about you, that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. We're not letting God in on it. He already knows it. What you need to know is he's given you a way out and it's through his son, Jesus Christ. And I promise you this, I can't guarantee everyone at AFM will love you right but I promise I'm going to love you and I don't care what your background is I don't care what your story is I don't care how bad it is if you're willing to come to the foot of the cross and confess your sin and ask Jesus to save you surrendering your life to him he will he will if the whole world shuns you who cares I'd rather have Jesus and no one than have everyone else and not Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you. I thank you for your truth. I thank you for the, the parts that are easy to read that cause us to want to jump up and down and celebrate. And then the hard parts. We need those. We need to be dealt with honestly, openly. And, and your word does that through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that we'll have ears to hear. 
spiritual ears. I pray that our spiritual eyes would be open through this sermon that we're studying. This is Jesus, the Son of God, preaching this. And I pray that we will surrender and through surrender that we take his yoke and learn how to follow him. And Jesus says his burden is light. So if we're weary, if we're frustrated, it's because we're trying to do things on our own might. Surrender that to Jesus too. I pray this in the name that is above all names, that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.